Even was now come, his disciples went down to the sea. I mean, the, in the evening. And he entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. Now, they had been in a different area. The Sea of Galilee is about nine miles long, about five miles wide. But it's shaped sometimes in ways you go to one area and to cross over would be to mean you wouldn't have to go around it. You would just kind of go over to Capernaum. Capernaum was his headquarters. That's where Simon Peter's house was. That's where Matthew, you remember, was a tax collector collecting that area. Most of his disciples come from right around the area of Capernaum. So he was going there, the scripture said. And knows what the Bible says. And it was now dark. And it was now dark. And Jesus was not come unto them. Have you ever read that line before? It's dark. But Jesus hadn't come unto them. And this is what it says. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. And when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea going night of the ship, and they were afraid. But he said to him, It is I, be not afraid. Then they willingly received him in the ship, and immediately, immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. And tonight I'm going to talk to them on this subject. When God leaves us in the dark. And it was now God. And Jesus did not come unto them. So there's a whole lot of storms in our life. And tonight we're going to talk about how to ride out the storm of darkness. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, Holy Spirit, I pray you'll help our congregation tonight. They, they've been waiting for the Word. I pray it'll be something God that will bless them and will help them Help them to walk with you and believe you and trust you and, and God to be real to them tonight. And Lord, I know that I make a mess a whole lot of times out of what you call me to do. And I pray, God, tonight you'll help me to stay in the center of your will. And God, most of all, you'll just smear yourself on me with power tonight. And I'll be able to preach and you'll pour out the love of God, the power of God, the presence of God, the peace of God all over this place tonight. And we'll, Lord, I, I just feel tonight you're going to help somebody. And God, maybe you're just going to re-help me. I don't know. But God, you're going to help somebody tonight. I know that if they'll listen. So God, help that person right now. Prepare their heart to get ready to get help from above. Hearts in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you know, we hear a whole lot today about Surviving. You know, we even now have on our weather broadcast surviving the storms. Every now we now we know if the storm is going to be in Oklahoma and when it's going to be in Tennessee and when it's going to be in Ohio and where it's going to be. And so we have programs called Surviving the Storms. And then we have reality TV shows called The Survivor. You know, where and you have to, I never got into that. Maybe you do. And, and they have this show where I think you're supposed to go through all these kind of processes and hopefully you'll be the last man standing, I guess, is the way it all works out. And it's called The Survivor. And, and we, we're having more and more programs that, that teach us and more and more plans and more and more articles teaching us how to survive certain situations. And there's always somebody got a message, right? Let me tell you how to get through this. Let me tell you how to get through that. Let me tell you how to get all over this and how, how, how to survive this and how to survive that. How to survive poverty and how to, how, to, how to survive sickness and on and on and on. You have all those kinds of things. But folks, let me tell you something. In these last days, I want you to just get ready for it. Get ready for it now. The storms are not only going to come, but they're going to come more and more and more frequently than we ever thought we'd ever see them before. Too fast for the news to cover. Too fast for you to text about. They're going to be storm after storm after storm in your life. But here's what I want you to know tonight. The worst storm I've ever faced in my life. The hardest storm
storms I've ever faced in my life is not what you would suspect. And probably if I talked to you and you was honest, it's not what you would expect. But the hardest storms I've ever faced in my life is the storm of darkness. When it seems like God wasn't anywhere. When it seemed like God didn't show up. And God didn't speak. And God didn't bless. And God didn't touch. And God didn't move. And God didn't show up. The storm of darkness is what I am scared of the most. And I've been through those storms. The storms of darkness. And friend, when you go through those, we don't need federal money. It won't fix it. Right? You can fly in Obama and Joe Biden all you want to. Shoot at him on the way here for you got my blessing. But I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> they cannot fix the storm of darkness. Are y'all getting this? Right. Listen, nobody that the government can send can fix the storm that comes when we're in a time when it was now dark. But Jesus did not come to them. That's what the Bible says. Now, I, I do not know about you, but I've had some days of darkness in my life, and I know Pastor Jeff has, and others of you here have. I don't, I don't understand those days. I'm just going to be honest. I don't clearly understand them. Days when your prayer seems kind of like just a bunch of empty chatter. Days when it uh, seems like when you're preparing a sermon, it's just no word from God. You, you can't get anything. The deeper you dig, it seems like the harder it gets. And, and, and times when you just don't seem like you're getting any voice from God at all and none of your prayers are, are getting answered and the Bible seems just like it's not got anything to say to you whatsoever in your life and, and you give it everything you've got. In fact, you even give it more and yet the more you do and the more you try and the more you pray and the more you read and the more you witness and the more you tithe, it seems the more useless it is. God just don't seem to be there. You ever been there? That's called a storm of darkness. Jesus, it was now dark. Jesus did not come unto them. It's times when we don't sense His presence. Oh, he said, I don't think a believer goes to that. Don't you act spiritual, old man. None of you that spiritual. There are some days when it seems like Jesus' presence is not real. There are some days when you don't sense the presence of God. Those are the storms of darkness. And when those times come, I immediately start confessing my sin. I make some up. <laughs> just anything. Anything, God. Just anything to help out here. Try to pray more. Try to study more. Try to witness more. Try to, just try to serve a little harder. Now, the, now those of you who don't walk with God, you're not going to understand this. Because you've never known the presence of God. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't miss it anyway because you've never known it. But those of you those of you who walk with God, you know it when you go through a storm of darkness. But if you never walk with God, you're already in darkness. You're going to stay in darkness. You're never coming out of darkness until you come to Jesus Christ who is the light. But if you walk with God, you know when all of a sudden something happens in your life and the lights go out. I can't explain it, but I know what happens. You say, well, you're just not spiritual. Well, you can say if you want to, but I will just remind you, I'm not talking about the darkness of sin. I'm not talking about the darkness of love and sin. I hate sin. I hate what sin done to me before I got saved. I hate what sin does to me now. And I hate what sin does to other people. I hate sin. So it's not the darkness of sin. It's not the darkness of disobedience because I, I in my heart, I don't always do it, but I seek to obey the will and mind of God. So it's not that. It's not the darkness of eternal losses. I know I'm saved. I'm sure I'm saved. I believe I can swing across hell on a rotten corn stalk and not ever tie the land. Amen. I believe I'm saved. I know it's not that darkness. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about the darkness of insecurity. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about the darkness of confession because I can go to God and confess my sins and I can believe He can forgive my sins. I don't have to feel anything. I just believe He forgives my sins because He said He would. Amen. Are y'all with me? Amen. I'm 
not even talking about the darkness of Satan. I'm in situations and sometimes even in our church when it's obvious that Satan is at work and you can sense the presence of his evil darkness. And I'm not talking about the darkness of Satan. I've dealt with that. The Bible says in Acts 26, 18, Paul said, so turn them from darkness to light from the power of Satan unto God. I'm not talking about that kind of darkness. I'm not even talking about the darkness of sleep. The Bible tells us that we are not those who should be caught in darkness, but we are those who are of the light, right? Folks, I believe Jesus could come at any moment. I'm looking for Jesus. I'm leaving for Jesus. I believe Jesus is going to show up. I'm not talking about that kind of thing. I'm not talking about that at all. But I am talking about. I see my sin. I'm aware and cautious of Satan every day. I know what my calling is. I know what God called me to do. I can't do anything else if I wanted to. I was a pole climber. God called me from climbing poles to trying to win souls. That's what I do. And so, I, it's not that. But I'm talking about when it comes to those times in a Christian life when it seems like God just is nowhere there. You say, well, that don't happen. It happened to Jesus. So how do you know that? Mark chapter 1, verse 12 through 13, the Bible says that after he was baptized, that the Spirit led him into the wilderness, and it was very dark. In fact, 40 days of temptation and the presence of the Father was not anywhere noticed there. We're not told that the angels came and ministered to him until after the 40 days. And so for 40 days, Jesus was there being test tested and tempted by the worst temptations you can face. The scripture tells us that. Not only that, David faced it. You can find that in Psalm 18, verse 28 and 29, where David said, For thou wilt light my candle, the Lord will enlighten my darkness, for by thee have I run through a troop, and by thee have I leaped over a wall. David had been through some time in his life that was dark. Now David, who was a man of God's own heart, had been in darkness. And Jesus, who was God, had been in darkness. I expect me and you are going to be in darkness. Y'all with me? Amen. Job 19, verses 8 and 9. Verse 25 and 27, Job said, I don't know why that you've left me in, in darkness. And he began to try to dialogue about this matter of being in, in darkness. And all of a sudden he said, but I know that my Redeemer liveth. And I will stand again at the last day. Hallelujah. So uh, Job was left in darkness. I know that there was a song leader, Asaph, was left in darkness, a musician. I know some people believe music, musicians are always in the dark, but I think some of them are in the light. Amen. You know, musicians are weird people. Do you know that? <laughs> they really are. But then the musicians say preachers are weird people, so I guess it's just a lot of weird people. But the truth of the matter is, Psalm 88 said there was a song leader there who wrote a song, and three times in that song he said he was in darkness. While he was writing a song. Think about it. And then Jeremiah in Lamentations chapter 3 verse 2 and Lamentations chapter 3 verse 6 says he hath led me. Now get this. I want you to get this. Don't you miss it. He hath led me and brought me into darkness. I call that spirit led darkness. So tonight I'm going to talk to you about when the storm of darkness will come in your life. Are y'all ready for this? I'm going to give you three things, but under those three things, there will be about 29 other things, all right? <laughs> Number one, when the storm of darkness will come to your life, when does it come? After the trial. Yeah. Always remember that. You see, after an accomplishment, after you've been successful, after there's been some achievement, after there's been some thrills, after there's been some blessings, after God has touched something in your life and things is going good. You see, you, you remember in John chapter 6 what he went on that day? These 12 apostles had attended services all day long and they had heard the heavenly pastor himself preach all day long. Oh, what a meeting that must have been. Amen? And you know, he had watched them feed the 5,000 and they witnessed him feed 5,000 men plus boys and girls with five loaves and two fishes. Oh, what a day that must have been. That would put every McDonald's in Middle Tennessee out of business. And Jesus did that. It had been, a, it 
didn't know whether the enthusiasm around it had become so powerful and so great that they said, this is our king now. We're going to make him a king. But you see, Jesus didn't come to be the king the first time. He came to be the savior. He was already king. But when he comes the next time, he'll be king of kings and the Lord of Lord. Right. And every knee shall bow. But the first time he came to seek and to save, that which was lost. Amen. So when he said they'd come to force him to be a king, Jesus departs and goes up into the mountain to pray. It had been one, one more day for those disciples. Yeah. Crowds everywhere. Atmosphere supercharged with the power and presence of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then they go to the sea. And in just a few moments, it was dark. Mm -hmm. And Jesus was nowhere <clears throat> to be found. Remember another time that happened that Jesus, the day that John the Baptist baptized Jesus, and the Bible said that they saw the Spirit like a dove. It wasn't a dove. The Bible don't say that. It said the Spirit like a dove rested upon him. It, it, and if you read a little bit, in all the accounts, it says it was in the shape of a man. It, it was showing us what the fullness of the Spirit looks like. When you get saved, God comes and covers all of you with the Spirit of yeah. God, not yeah. part of you. You don't get a piece of Him here and a piece of Him here and a little more over there and a little more the next time. Mm -hmm. And it had been a great day. And John had said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the world. The, the sins of the world. Yeah. And then what happened? Immediately the Spirit driveth him to the It was after the trial. Y'all yeah. still with me? Yeah. You see, storms come when your ministry is doing well, it's booming, your church is growing, and the finances is good, the crowds are coming, Sunday school's doing well. The spirit is sweet, you know. The preaching is easy, you know, and, and things is just, just rolling along. And it seems like every prayer you pray, it's answered before you get it out of your mouth. And it just everything is just going great. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, mm -hmm. darkness. Yeah. You don't know why. It just darkness. God just cuts out the lights. Nobody, are y'all hearing me? Are y'all? Is anybody with me? telling you, it happened in the Bible, it's going to happen to you, and it has happened to me. In 2010, I've been in, the pastor was asking me, I've been in our Hillcrest Baptist Church for 26 years. Went to that place God blessed, we had seen so many mighty things that would take me for weeks to tell it, but our church was going good, life was good, souls was being saved every week. We were baptizing people right and left. I had uh, gotten my first grandkids, the prettiest ones that ever been born. And uh, my daughter had gotten married. And then 2010 of September, the hero of my life, my mother, went home to be with Jesus. Somehow I just never imagined my life without mom. And in September, she went home to be with Jesus. In November, my daughter, 34 years old, found a lump in her breast herself. She had just been to the doctor a couple of months ago and they pronounced everything fine. And all of a sudden, they checked her and they said, we have to do immediate surgery. She has the fastest growing kind of cancer. It's the most aggressive cancer of the state. We've got to go quickly. So they took her to surgery and they took out nine tumors, some as big as tennis balls, out of my daughter. And they cut the muscles and, and things all the way back. And then they took where they had to cover up the, the holes. They had to try to take skin from her. And so they took 17% of her stomach and they covered. Then they put her through radiation and they put her through chemo and then they put her through a test chemo and, and, and she went through all of that. Then her stomach burst open where they had put the, taken the skin. And so we went through all of that and through it all, God just seemed blessed, but yet you wondered, God, why? 
just 34. I'm old, God, you just took me. So then things went along in that same year. I went to the hospital. I'd had 14 day surgeries and I went to the hospital to get my knee operated on. And when I went in to get my first knee replacement done, they sent me home sick. I wasn't feeling well. They sent me home after two days. Everything looks great, doing good. But I had got an infection in my throat. I got very, very sick. They said, well, it's just strep. You'll be okay. Nobody ever cultured it. Nobody ever checked it. I just kept poking antibiotics down. And I get to feel a little bit better. I get sick again. Finally, I got so sick one night, they called a special service at the church. I couldn't get up off that couch. My wife thought I was dying. And, and just at the moment they started to pray at the church, God revived them back. And, and so... I battled that back and forth. Finally, I found myself in the hospital with pneumonia, and they come and said, you have cancer, and um, we don't know exactly what kind. We just know you have multiple myeloma. You also were positive for rheumatoid lupus, and you have some other kind of autoimmune disease, and you're a very sick man. Your, your level is at two, and said, so we don't know what to do for you. And so they sent me to doctors. I've been all over the country, you know, Mayo Clinic. Um, I, I, I go to Vanderbilt now all the time, but I've been to this doctor and that doctor and this doctor and that doctor. And they, everyone would said, you're through finished. I lost my voice. I couldn't preach. I'd start a revival and have to quit it because in the middle, I, I, I'd finished it. It would be so horrible. You could uh, uh, barely understand me. And, and I was getting discouraged. I, I didn't have enough energy to make it through the day. I just could barely get up, and that's not like me. I would work 8, 16, 18 hours a day, 7 days a week. I'd always done it. I was 59 years old. Never worked, been working all my life. Never knew what it was like time to work. And I just, things just kept going downhill. Finally, I was diagnosed with the cancer doctor that had seen my daughter. And by God's grace, God had brought her through and they said, I had polyps on my vocal cords and said, you're going to have to quit preaching. I said, you're going to quit pastoring your church. You can't carry this load. You can't take care of this many people. And you can't do what you're doing. You're going to have to give it up. Three different times I've been told to quit. I said, I can't quit. I'll die trying to get in the pulpit. And so I was finally diagnosed. The cancer doctor said, Dr. Race Q just got killed by a drunk driver not long ago, 59 years old, run a red light and killed Dr. Rasky, one of the greatest cancer doctors in America. And finally, he said, Doc, he said, preacher, he wasn't even taking new patients, but because my daughter had become kind of a poster child for, for what had happened to her, he said, I'll, I'll see your dad. And I can't find any cancer. I don't know where it's at. I was sure I had cancer. I thought so for some time because of some of the problems I've been having. They said, but we, so they sent me to other doctors and they finally diagnosed me with Sjogren's disease, which fights, it's an autoimmune disease. It fights my, my uh, moisture producing glands. That's why I keep water with me all the time. No, but not offensive. There's no, that's not, that's not vodka or gin. That's water. <laughs> now if you've got some, I'll fill it up before I leave. But that's water. <laughs> and so I, I, uh, I I got to where my tongue would stick to my, I, I, I couldn't hardly preach, Pastor. I just got to where something had to be done. So finally I got diagnosed. We, I, I finally, I, I call it my spit pill, and I got a little spit pill I take now, you know, that it kind of keeps me where I have some saliva. So with no saliva, I was having trouble swallowing. I couldn't swallow, I couldn't digest, and I couldn't empty, and I couldn't, nothing worked right in my, by my eyes. I, now I, I dropped, you know, so many levels, and I have to go to the eye doctor every three months. And it was just, it was a, it was a constant, it was just a constant something all the time. Then I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia with it, and then I was diagnosed with rheumatoid lupus, and then I have osteo, can osteo uh, so bad, arthritis so bad that they say we can't do anything with you. It's like you have cancer of the bone, your bone is just all fall, you know, just just eat up. And so up and down your spine, all the way everywhere, your shoulders everywhere. And I, 
I knew that. So I'd, I'd live with pain. I just thought it was natural. And so I learned how to manage things. And then this past last year, I come home. Our water, I fixed our water. We, we had, uh, things happened to our house, and we got animals got in the house and tore the ducks up and. And my sewer, something that broke from my sewer pipe was, was pulling sewer up in the house and we got sick from that. And, and so finally, I come home and my wife had been a little sick and I said, you got a kidney stone. And so we knew that. I went to the church to get some ice because I, we couldn't use ours. And I was gone 10 minutes. I came back and I got home. Her, her eyes was rolled back into her head. She couldn't speak. She was gone. I thought she was dead. And so I started shaking her and sort of massaging her face and, and, and making her time like her talk to me. She couldn't say anything. She was just upstairs. She was there. And and I, I just said her fever was high. And so I, I kept her on the phone. I got 911 when I was there to meet and they put her in. And I knew she'd be dead when I got to the hospital. But they called her the miracle woman now because she went to the hospital. They didn't know what to do. They, they, they had they go here and then they go there. They go here and they go there. They didn't know what to do. They couldn't do, do anything. They'd never seen somebody come in. Her temperature was 107.9. They'd never seen anybody live with a temperature that high. Or if they did live, have complete brain damage. And yet my wife, I said, y'all going to do something. So I started pinching the feet. You know I'm pinching feet. <laughs> and I pinched the feet. They called the police. He didn't come in and say anything to me. He better not have. <laughs> I said, listen, y'all going to do something for her. You're going to get this fever down. Because I said, when she's in this pain, there's no way she's going to come to. They gave her a suppository. Her fever dropped two degrees. And she came out of her coma. And the lady that surprised everyone. Of them. She stayed in the hospital nine days. You look at her now. She's just as mean as she's always been. You wouldn't have anything that ever happened. So to be honest, there were some of those days to where I was laying on that couch just not able to do anything. Saying, God, why? So sick. It might take me two hours just to get ready in the morning. Be so sick. So not in that. God turned out the lights. When did it come? After the trial. When God turns out your light, so it usually come when things is going its best. Number two, why do they come? First of all, because of the constraint of Jesus, He required them to go across. <coughs> Mark chapter 6, verse 45 and 46, the Bible said He constrained them. That means that word means to necessitate. Jesus wouldn't have it any other way. In other words, you're going to cross that sea and you're going to do it tonight and you're going to do it in the dark, boys. If you're going to be, be obedient to me, get in the ship and go across tonight. I constrain you. I compel you. I command you. Do it. So Jesus sent them into a storm. Jesus knew the storm was coming. And yet he sent them into the storm. The storm wasn't the disciples' idea. The storm was Jesus' idea. Y'all yeah. yeah. get this? Yeah. So storms are not always being in the wrong place at the right time. Sometimes storms are because you're in the right place <laughs> doing the right thing. Yeah. Y'all with me? Yeah. You see, this storm surprised the disciples, but it didn't just surprise our thing. Because the Bible said he went up into the mountain to pray. And so it didn't, it, didn't, it didn't shock him at all because I've got news for you tonight. Our Lord controls the storms. Oh, you said that's talking about the tornadoes and the tsunamis and, and, and all earthquakes. No, no, no. I'm talking about the storms of darkness. Our Lord controls those storms. And he constrained them to go across. This storm came not because they were out of his will, but this storm came because they were in his will. There's two kinds of Christian storms. The first one's a storm of correction. Jonah got one of those. And God had to straighten him out. You know? Fish picked me up. I think I'd straighten up too, don't you? And so 
And that's a storm of correction. Sometimes God has to take the belt to us. Sometimes He has to take us out behind the barn. Beat the stew out of us. Amen? Yeah. And so that's called the storm of correction. That's called the Bible calls chastening. God spanks His children. So don't come to me with all that lovely, mushy stuff that God doesn't do, treat His kids like that. That's why some of our kids today are so sorry because their mom and dad don't do what our father does. Yeah. Spank their behinds when they need it. So, sometimes as a Christian, I've had my behind spanked. What about you? Amen. There's a storm of correction. But then the second thing, there's a storm of perfection. <laughs> you remember what Job said? Job said, when he had tried me, that means when he had tested me, when he put me through the storms, I shall come forth as gold. Amen. So there's a storm of perfection. Not only because of constraint, but number two, because of the crowd that was following Jesus. You see, our tests don't come when there's a big crowd. It don't come when everybody's up singing and shouting and hallelujah and running the aisles and praising God and lifting their hands and all having a good time. No, no, no. That's not when the tests come. It's easy to praise God like that. It's easy to get happy like that. It's easy to rejoice like that. That's not when the storms come. They come not when the crowds are there, but when the crowds leave. Right. Have you noticed that? Oh, I like crowds. Just give me a crowd that'll fire me up. When I look out on Sunday morning and we're down 25, I get depressed. And we have, you know, we, we, we have pretty good crowds all the time. But I, I love a crowd. And the bigger the crowd is, the more it fires me up, the more it stirs me up. But folks, God don't test us in the midst of the crowd. I'm at my best in the crowd. Amen. Put me before a crowd, and that's where I excel. But boy, when you get with just you, and you don't sense God anywhere, that's when you know it's a storm of darkness. Right. So he got them away from the crowds. Sent the crowds away. See, there's two kinds of tests that Jesus gives us once we get in the storm. There's the kind where he's in the boat. Remember that one? He was asleep in the boat. And then there's the kind when he's not in the boat and nowhere to be found. That's the tough one. As long as he's in the boat, I can at least wake him up. But when I don't see him anywhere or feel him anywhere or sense him anywhere, I wonder what's happened to my God. Are y'all with me? Amen. And so that spirit led darkness. But here's the third reason they did it. Because of commitment for Jesus. The test that God gives us to see if they would quit and go back. God will put us through a storm of darkness to see if we're living by faith or if we're living by sight. If you just live by sight, then when everything's going great, you're fine. But when you cut off the lights, you'll quit living for God. So He puts us in the storm of darkness to test our commitment. So what do you mean? Well, because some of these people had a sick commitment. John 6, verse 2 said, the only reason they're following Jesus is because He made them well. Hey, they had Obamacare, except it was Jesus' care. <laughs> and it was far better and cheaper and clearer and purer and holier than Obamacare. Amen. So he, but you know, there's some folks follow Jesus because they got this health and wealth mentality. Well, if I'm walking with God, I'll never get sick. Well, I don't know where you got that, but you didn't get it out of the book. That's right. <laughs> In fact, the greatest people God had, the Bible says Elijah was God's greatest prophet, Elisha was. And you know what the Bible says about him? He died with a sickness. So there's some people have a sick commitment. Some of you here tonight, that's what you're, you have a sick commitment. You just follow Jesus just as long as you feel good. I'll say, I, I go to some of my people sometimes and say, listen, I ain't saying you know what, where you been? Oh, well, you know, my kids have been sick, and you know, my, 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 my husband's been sick, and oh, my wife's been sick, and my grandmama's been sick, mom and dad's been sick. I said, listen, if y'all was that sick, you need to be in the funeral home or the nursing home. One of the two. Bless God, you better be careful about using your kids to stay away from serving God. Amen. And using your family. God can see to it that it really does get that way. You better be careful about that mess. Lying on God like that. Lying to God like that. 
Some have sickness. Number two, and some, get this, some has a supper commitment. <laughs> they followed Jesus because he fed them. You take the food. This, if we're going to have a big feeding at our church, brother, they come out of the woodwork like termites. <laughs> Folks you never seen before, never see again. And I, they don't just get one plate, they get about three or four plates. If it's hot dog, then if we have an outdoor picnic and hot dog, they'll have 14 stacked up on one plate. And then they'll take them home to all their family and friends and neighbors and cats and dogs. <laughs> Makes me want to beat the tar out of every one of them. <laughs> They got a supper committee. And that's what some of you got. You got a supper committee. Well, I only come when I have dinners down there. You better be careful. God can see if you might not have dinner at your house anytime. So God puts us in a storm of darkness to see if we'll follow Him even if we're sick. And we'll follow Him even if we're getting hungry. Number three. Some has a selfish commitment. They wanted a king. Verse 15 said, but not a Lord. Yeah. Yeah. They want a king to run things out there and make everything better, but not a Lord to tell them what to do. Yeah. Some of you, you've got a selfish commitment. You only want Jesus to do what you want Him to do so you can do what you want to do. Right. You don't want to say, Lord, I am yours. So the disciples were tested. It was dark. And Jesus did not come in. Here's the last thing I'm through. I see some of you getting nervous already. The last thing is what to do in the storm. Here's the teaching. First thing you do is you wait on Him. John 6, 17 and 18 makes it very clear that they did exactly what Jesus told them to do. They went down into the sea, entered into the ship, went over the sea toward, toward Capernaum. In other words, they did exactly what Jesus did, and even though Jesus was not coming to them, they waited on Him. You see, Jesus knew all about their plight. In the stormy darkness, you might not see Jesus, but take good, good word, Jesus sees you. Yeah, you see, his eye is not just on the sparrow. But thank God his eye is on us. Mm -hmm. And he sees them. And there he stood up there on the mountain and he watched them. And they're rowing. And they're rowing. And they're rowing. And the storm is blowing. And their heart is scared. And they're, where's Jesus? Yeah. Where's Jesus? But they're waiting on him. Surely Jesus is going to come. Surely Jesus is going to come. Then... About 3 o'clock in the morning, here comes Jesus walking on the water. Oh, praise God, he come walking on the water. I want you to remember this. If y'all remember everything I say tonight, remember this. Jesus is never as far away as you think he is. Right, right. Mm -mm. So you wait on him. Because he's been watching over us all the time. Who sent him out there? Jesus did you think Jesus would have sent them out there if he wasn't going to watch over them? He sent them out there. Not only that, what, what, what did the Bible say he did when he went to Matthew? He prayed. So not only is he watching over us, he's praying for us. I'm glad I got somebody tonight, hallelujah, I know praying for me. Yeah, right. I'm glad I know somebody is watching over me. Yeah. You say, well, you're not a big shot. No, I'm just a little shot. I'm just a little fish in a big old pond. That's all I am. But I'm a saved sinner, washed in the blood, born again, saved by God's grace, on my way to heaven. And because of that, God keeps His eye right on me. Amen. And not only that, He constantly prays for me. Amen. And you. Somebody help me. And Amen. you. I said, and you. Y'all believe that? You. You. He's watching you. He's praying for you. And then you may think nobody ever prays for you. But they do. You remember, it's not in John, it's not in the gospel I read tonight, but it's in Matthew or, or, or Mark or Luke, the Mark's account, I believe it says, that he comes walking to them on the water, and one of them said, It's a ghost. He 
It's a ghost. It's a ghost, Father. It's a ghost coming in the store. My little granddaughter, now she's about six. She's a puffy little gal. And, and uh, when she was younger, she used to run around in the house and I was laying on the couch and she'd make me, she'd say, she'd say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to play monster. And so I'd lay down on the couch and she would go and she'd say, I'd pretend I was asleep. And just like I was sleeping. And she'd go and she'd start to count. She'd say, one, two, three. Four, eight, twelve, sixteen. Here I come! And she'd come to me and she'd start tickling me on the leg, tickling me on the arm, tickling me on the ear. And I'd just lay there and then all of a sudden I'd jump up and I'd go, Ah! I'm a monster! She said, You're not a monster, you pop <laughs> You see, folks, listen, a lot of us think the monsters in our life is out to get us when it's only Jesus coming to save us. Yeah. In the darkness of our storm. But there's a the second thing. He's coming to us. They looked up. Not only was he watching them, not only was he praying for them, but he was coming to them. That's what verse 19 says. <laughs> He's the master of the sea. He comes strolling across the water like he'd walk across a grassy slope. You say, what does that mean to me? That means one of these days he's going to come for me. And I'm going to walk on up through the sky. And I'm going to walk on the clouds when Jesus calls. Because he's coming for us. Are y'all with me tonight? Is he coming for you? What is that right now? Do you know for sure you go to him? When, when, he, when he comes to your house tonight in your sleep, if he were to come for you, do you know you'd go to heaven? If he were to cry tonight, come up, my child, do you know you'd go up with the church tonight? Do you know he's coming for you? Yeah. Or is he sending some, letting, allowing some demons to stand around you, and the moment you cease to breathe, they'll drop into a burning hell? Now, look, is, is he coming for you? He was coming for them. And then fourthly, he will save us when he comes. John 6, 21 said, At that moment, verse 20, fear disappeared. He quieted their fears. Their struggle was over. All their working and rowing and struggling could not accomplish what <coughs> his presence could immediately do. Isn't that blessing? If you can't shout about that, I can. I can shout about that. You say, well, the first thing I'm going to do is wait for him. Well, the second thing I'm going to do is work for him. You know what they was doing while they was in their darkness? Here's what they was doing. Rowing and toiling. Rowing and toiling. Toiling and rowing. Toiling and rowing. That means they was working and rowing. Rowing a boat's hard work. Especially in a storm. And they just kept on rowing. And, you know, all they had to do to go back to the other side was quit rowing. And the wind would have blown them right back where they came from. And so, but they said, no, 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 no. Jesus told us to go to the other side. And we're going to the other side. And we're going to keep rowing. And we're going to keep toiling. And we're going to keep working. And we're going to keep working. One of these days, we're going to get to the other side. Yeah. And so until Jesus comes, you know what you're going to keep doing? I'm going to keep preaching. I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep studying. I'm going to keep loving. I'm going to keep giving. I'm going to keep witnessing. I'm going to keep trying to get folks saved. Yeah. Listen, why? Because I'm working for Him. Yeah. Are you working for Him? Yeah. One day, thirdly, you have to wheel to Him. He'll go on by you, go you and invite me. He come walking by, and by one, one of the passages says, he would, as if he would have went by. <clears throat> you, know what to do? you have to will him to come into your boat. He will not come into your boat if you don't want him. I don't care what the bunch of Calvary says. I don't care what that crowd says. I believe what Jesus said. That when he went to the cross, he died for the sins of the world. That's, right. That's everybody, best I can figure out. Amen. When he said, whosoever will, let him come. I believe whosoever will can come. Right. It's the whosoever won't come right. that I'm worried about. Yeah. Right. You 
You've got a will to heal. You've got a will to heal. I like it when one of my parents handed me the other day and said one of our little kids gets saved. He'd make fun of me. Because in Bible school, we have a great, huge, big Bible school. And every day, on, on, I, 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 we build up to it. And on Thursday every year, I get down and I just kind of preach to the children. They start counting on their level for about 15 minutes. And I give an invitation and invite them to come to Jesus Christ. And then on Friday, I come back up and I clean the gleanings of the field, what was left over. And so this year we had, you know, about 70 or 80 kids, 90 kids saved. I'm not sure what it was. Oh, yeah. And people would say, that's, that's, I, I mean, last year I think we had over 100. And the folks would make fun of them. <coughs> they get kids over there, they mess them up. Them kids don't know how to be saved. They're too young to be saved. Well, you tell me where that at in the Bible. Right. Right. Last I checked, the convictor is the Holy Ghost. Yeah, right. Right. Last I checked, the Savior is the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Right. Last I checked, He don't have to check with us to save anybody. Amen. 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 Right. Amen. Right. Right. And so, uh, those little kids, when my parents came to me the other day, said, "You know," said they was telling me she's six years old. She she went to church, church, and I mean went to school, and uh, the teacher said, "Now." You know, what did you do over the summer? And so everybody had to get up and tell somebody what they did over the summer. When they got to this little girl, she stood up in the chair and she said, Well, this summer I was a lost and dirty and mean and what a vile and ugly sinner. But Jesus came into my heart and saved me this summer. <laughs> But she knew she was a sinner. Yeah. And she knew he was a saint. Yeah. Folks, I'm telling you, he's coming to you. He's coming to you tonight if you let him. He'll come in here tonight if you let him. If you don't, one of these days he'll come for those who did let him. And those who didn't will be left. Are you ready for the storm? Because if you hadn't had one, one's coming. There'll be a time when you don't sense much God. And you wonder what's going on. He figured it out. Can't explain it. Just don't know what to do. Say, God, I love you. I've never quit loving you. Why is, it, why is these things happening? Why, where, where are you? God, why don't you do something? Why, God? Why? Where are we? Just remember. He's watching you. He's watching you. He's praying for you. And if you'll keep rolling and toiling, He's coming to you. Yeah. And in your storm of darkness, this is what I've found. I've had more power and I have a dream because of going through the storms and darkness. I've had people say to me, Preacher, I don't know I could have made it had I not watched you not quit. Some of you quit. You just quit real way. You used to say to the choir, but you quit. You used to teach class, but you quit. You used to be a witness, but you quit. You used to pray, but you quit. You used to be a soul winner, but you quit. The storm just got too tough for you. You know why? Because you're walking by sight and not by me. Now, I don't want to ask you a simple question. If you know in your area some lives you let walk with God, you know right now you quit rolling and toiling. You gave it up a long time ago. Maybe it's one area. Maybe your prayer life. Maybe your Bible study life. Maybe your soul winning life. Maybe your tithing life. But you just quit. Or you gave it up. You say, well, I don't really give it a tithe. I just can do the best I can. Then you're disobedient to God. You need to get right with God tonight. Because if you don't keep on rolling and toiling, when He comes, you'll be ashamed. But if you're rolling and toiling when He comes, you can say, Jesus, I knew you'd show up. I knew you'd show up. 
That bill was due and I knew you'd show up. I was hurting inside and I knew you'd show up. 